So Shalom Aleichem everyone and welcome to this program. Um, I would like to first of all thank Ceres at the University of Chicago and the Greenberg Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Chicago for making this event possible. Um, and, um, and I would like to introduce our speaker for today. So um, the Yiddish program at the University of Chicago is very pleased to um, have presenting for us Michal Yashinsky, who was born in Detroit and educated at Harvard and is an actor, director, writer, and Yiddishist. He recently appeared with the National Yiddish Theater Volksbina in the drama desk winning Yiddish Fiddler on the Roof, directed by Joel Gray and The Sorceress, a New York Times critic's pick, for which performance he was hailed by the Times for giving keen, if, if malevolent psychology to the title role. His Detroit Opera House production of The Happy Prince was praised by Opera Magazine, which wrote that in a clear staging by Yashinsky, the work had a joyful presentation. Forthcoming publications include his translation of the memoirs of the theatrical pioneer Esther Rojo Kaminska um, and In Enim um, by the Yiddish Book Center, which is a new Yiddish textbook that he co-authored and that we teach with here at the University of Chicago. Um, he has taught uh, the Yiddish language at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and at the University of Michigan. So we're very excited to have him uh, talk. And before he begins, just a few um, details, technical details. Um, this program is being recorded. It is also being live streamed to YouTube. Um, if you have questions, as you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. And if they're relevant to the particular moment when Michal is speaking, he, he may pause and answer them, or we may have them at the end of the session, depending on uh, how they seem to fit in. If you are watching on YouTube, you can also um, post your questions there, and we will be watching that as well. Um, yeah, so I think that is everything, and um, I'm very much looking forward to hearing your presentation, Michal. Welcome to the University of Chicago, as it were. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here in my bedroom talking with all of you uh, wherever you may be. Um, I am going to talk about Yiddish theater and my experiences therein. And through my experiences, I'll be able to talk more broadly about interesting periods and moments and personalities of Yiddish theater historically. Uh, my start in the Yiddish theater was in college, actually, because there was a wonderful person at Harvard named Deborah Kaplan, who was doing her dissertation on Yiddish theater at the time, and I was an undergrad, and she had the idea to direct uh, an evening of scenes from Yiddish theater and to take a bunch of students who did not know Yiddish uh, of which I was one at the time, and to teach them as much as they needed to perform scenes in an authentic way and with the correct intonation and emotion and character. And I really, uh, I saw this advertised and seized upon it and got a couple roles. And that really showed me some of the breadth and diversity and fascination of Yiddish theater. Um, I'll show an image of me in one of those roles uh, that I took when I was in Deborah Kaplan's Die ganze Welt is a Theater, The Whole World is a Theater, um, in which I played the role of Levi Yitzchok, a yeshiva bucher in the Dybbuk, a yeshiva bocher in Greenfelder, uh, Greenfields, which is a pastoral romance, and also Honen, uh, who is the sort of romantic figure of the Dybbuk, who dies and possesses uh, the woman that he loved. And we performed it at Harvard, and people were very eager to come and had full houses. And then a few months later, I think, we went to uh, a home for elderly people in the Boston area and performed for them. Um, so here, 
am I with Cecilia Raker, co-star, and just talking to a couple of wonderful Jewish seniors and learning from them after our performance. Uh, it's a wonderful sort of intergenerational thing as Yiddish theater, connects us to periods bygone, works of centuries ago or of last century or a few decades ago or of current times. And it connects us with people who maybe have memories of earlier Yiddish theater or who speak Yiddish from the home. So uh, that's been wonderful. And it's been as wonderful to meet such people as these old folks in a retirement home in Boston as it has been later in my career in Yiddish theater to meet people like we see here, people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg and uh, Kate McKinnon, who plays Ruth Bader Ginsburg on SNL, they both came on one night to Fiddler Off and Dach, to the Yiddish Fiddler on the Roof, that I performed in more recently uh, with the National Yiddish Theater Volksbühne. And this picture, it, it just, it means a lot to me to see it because here are some personalities that I really grew up admiring. And now I had a chance to perform for them or be directed by them in the case of Joel Gray the wonderful actor, director, who directed us in Fiddler Off and Dach, the Yiddish translation of Fiddler on the Roof. Um, I think I'll perform something from Fiddler. In Fiddler, I had a couple of roles. I played Nochem the Beggar and Mordecai the Innkeeper, a couple of men around the shtetl there with the coin cup strung around my neck. I am as Nochem the Beggar. And they're standing in the middle of this crowd at the wedding that ends act one as Mordechai the innkeeper. He's the sort of Badchen character at the end of act one of Fiddler. Badchen is an important figure actually for the Yiddish theater because this was a sort of wedding jester, a person who would stand on a chair at a wedding and improvise rhymes and honor the bride and groom and make the bride weep and make the crowd weep and laugh. And he was just a wedding entertainer. It was uh, partly something that led to the development of a Yiddish theater because there was this authentic form of Yiddish speech making and joking and jesting. And that was sort of one of the precursors to Yiddish theater. So I was very happy to take this role which had me playing this Badchen character. So this is, the wedding speech that he gives to the bride and groom, Mottel and Seitel, uh, and welcomes everyone to the wedding. And yeah. Um... Sorry. Oh boy. Um, next slide. All right, here we are. All right, so. Moi rai vera boi sai, mir zenen gekum naher, mesamer zu sein, chosen kale, dem chosen motl und die kale zeit, lense ihr simche, so und sie sich zusammen eltern in schollem neuscher und in glick, Halleweir, boinische Leulem. Amen. Und ot kommt unser Waliter Rebbe, langleben soll er, boinische Leulem. Amen. Drosche Geschenk von Tate Mame Kales Zad, lekove dem Jungen por Volk, an nei Iberbet, zwei puchene Kischens und die zwei Leichtes. Silberne, silberne, Und das ist es. Und jetzt, meine Liebe, auf unser Gereis her simche, und mir sich der Mann in unsere Teile, was er in der Weg auf eurem Habe, unsere vergangene Obers, was am Geleit mit Zoris in Kapzon ist, und was er in Abgestorben mit Zoris in Kapzon ist. Aber genug gewähnt, freilich soll sein Jüden, freilich. Und wie bei unserer guten freien Laser Wolf, was vermocht als Ding auf der Welt, äußere Kalle. 
Aber Leiser Wolf hat nicht kein Beis Herz von Lille. Wer horreie, hat er allein und so was für ein Drasche geschenkt, geht er schenken dem jungen vor Volk. Ja, moi, dre Blazer Wolf. So, that is uh, Mordechai, the innkeeper's big speech at the wedding as, as Badchen. Um, that was, it was somewhat easier to do that here than it was on stage, although I have no audience, which I uh, no audience physically before me, which always does help. But the difficult thing on stage was that I would perform this directly after the big wedding dance. So Muggle and Seitel get married under the chuppah, and then it erupts into this really lively, high-kicking, uh, twisting, twirling wedding dance. Um, a section that is called Whips and Hooks. It's been called that ever since Jerome Robbins choreographed it, and we were using mostly his choreography. And it's this very strenuous dance that Jerome Robbins uh, had taken inspiration from Hasidic weddings that he went to in Brooklyn. While he was preparing Fiddler on the Roof in the 60s, he went to Hasidic weddings and saw how the men danced and how they worked themselves into this rapturous sort of frenzy of movement. And he incorporated it, that a lot of that into this dance, Whips and Hooks, which follows the bottle dance, which the bottle dance is very difficult. I didn't take part in that. But some say the Whips and Hooks that follows it, which the whole men's ensemble takes part in, is uh, even more sort of difficult, or at least faster paced and a little more, uh, a little uh, more schwitzy. Um, so I had to do the speech always right after that. And I could take no time because Joel Gray was always very concerned as he ought to have been about keeping things moving. So I had to go right from the dance into the speech and I just had to work on my lung capacity. But it was a, a fun challenge. It was a, an amazing thing auditioning for this show, Fiddler Auf und Dach, because we had all heard that this was coming. This was the second production I took part in with the Volksbiene. We had heard about it in a big gala, sort of the winter before when we were performing The Sorceress, which is another show I did with them. And we all felt, okay, well, we must try out for this because it's Fiddler on the Roof, which we all love, and in Yiddish, in the sort of language of Sholem Aleichem stories that the musical is based on, it seems such a good idea. And then the stakes were heightened even more when we learned Joel Gray was going to direct. And I remember I was working at the Yiddish Book Center at the time, and I took a bus in to audition for the show in New York. And I was saying to a friend of mine, Stephanie Lynn Mason, who played Huddle eventually, who I was staying with uh, for the audition, I said, I really hope that Joel Gray isn't there for the audition because I feel I'll be so scared and intimidated because I so revered him kind of growing up and seeing Cabaret. And he was there. And I felt I would be so nervous the second I came in and saw him. But then he was this really sweet, smiling presence. And he was laughing throughout the audition when I would do something funny. And just really bright, radiant, smiling presence that put me instantly at ease. And um, the whole, the whole time in Fiddler was like that. The whole one and a half years, we ended up performing it. It was supposed to run just six weeks, and then like a Hanukkah miracle, it ran for much longer than that off Broadway. Um, yes. I, yes, so that's, that's Fiddler uh, on the roof. Um, mm. I thought I'd take a, a little break from um, performing things and talk about some history and read something from Esther Ochel Kaminska, who is, was considered the mamet of Yiddish theater. A Yiddish theater pioneer, grew up in a small shtetl uh, called Porozove, and at a young age loved to go out and pick berries in her shtetl with Jewish youths and with non-Jewish youths, she talks about this in her memoir, and sings songs. And she learns songs from the non-Jewish peasant youths in the village, the songs they would sing while harvesting. And she grew up just a talented little girl, the daughter of a chazan. Um, and 
her daughter, her father may not have been a chazan. He may have been a, a shamus, more of a, a sexton, more of the person who took care of a shul. She had a, a brother who was a chazan. Um, but anyway, this very shteldic sort of existence growing up. Uh, but she had a real in, innate talent and was sort of discovered and moved out to Warsaw where her sisters lived and became a star on the Yiddish stage, a really enormous star. And started her own theater and toured around the world. And this is her looking like a very elegant dame, uh, which she was, which she grew to be a, a real name. Um, but this I'm going to read from is a period before she was a name, really her first time appearing on stage. And it was in The Sorceress, which is a show that I'll talk about because I, I had the wonderful opportunity to be in that show. And that was her first time on stage. And you'll get a sense of how it was for her. A young girl who grew up in the shtetl, 20 years old, goes onto stage for the first time in Warsaw and performs in um, The Sorceress, Die Kischefmacherin. This is from her memoir, Derner und Blumen. Or maybe Blumen und Derner. Either way, it's either flowers and thorns or thorns and flowers, and right now, somehow I can't remember which. But I'm translating this memoir for an anthology of women on the Yiddish stage um, that's being edited by Alyssa Quint and Miriam Chaya Siegel. And I have the happy opportunity of translating this woman's memoirs, which were published after her death in 1926 and 1927, in the newspaper Der Moment in Warsaw, a Yiddish newspaper, which uh, today's Jewish magazine Moment is named for that old newspaper. And she has all sorts of funny, wonderful, wild stories of Yiddish theater. So this is uh, one of them. This is from a chapter, My First Steps on Stage. She talks about getting made up by a hairdresser named Antony. Polish hairdresser. Descending into the dressing rooms, which were located beneath the stage, we found all the actors already assembled. When they saw me, they rejoiced and came to congratulate me and wish me success. Then I was soon led to the hairdresser and makeup artist. Antony was his name. He sat me down and began to smear my face with some kind of fat. Up until then, my face had never had anything on it besides soap and water. Then he rubbed my cheeks with the carmine I had bought, sprinkled my face with the white powder, and using a matchstick, underlined my eyes with some black stuff. After reddening the edges of my nostrils and once again dumping powder over my entire face, he said, Pani Gatova, Polish for, you're ready. I rose, went to look in the mirror, and let out a scream. A scream so wild that it terrified everyone around me, and myself too. I simply could not recognize myself. As was typical, the people around me had a good laugh at my expense and called me by their old name for me, Yoldivke, Little Miss goody two-shoes. I pretended, uh, pretended I did not hear them and went right on combing my hair and getting dressed. When I was finished, I sat down to wait until I was called. I cannot possibly transmit with my pen all that I went through in the succeeding minutes before the performance. One would have to go through it oneself. Only my colleagues in this line who have experienced it themselves could possibly understand it. But try to imagine the position of a 20-year-old shtetl girl taken up and put up on a Warsaw stage where once such great artists performed as Jacob Adler, Spivakovsky, Grodner, Kessler, Weinstein, the Tanzmanns, along with so many others, so many icons. And now I was to perform here, after just two days of rehearsal, and in such an operetta as the famed Sorceress. I would just have to rely upon God's good graces. And she talks about the performance a little, but I want to get to some funny stuff that's in the middle of the performance. The fourth act takes place in Turkey. They dressed me in a pair of velvet pants with a sort of men's velvet jacket. I looked at myself and was put in rather a bad mood. Oy vey, I cried out. I should present myself before the public in this? But they told me I was now a singer who performs to the accompaniment of a barrel organ in the coffee houses of Constantinople. That's the scene. And this is how such people dressed. My fellow actresses also managed to calm me down by telling me I had lovely feet and so should certainly feel bold enough to go and perform with them quite bare. The costumier dressed me and the first violin quickly went through the last number. By mein Vater war ich ein einziges Kind. You notice that's in German, not Yiddish. They had to perform in German at this time because 
uh, the Tsarist government in Russia had banned the performance of Yiddish language theater. So they were doing this Yiddish operetta in German, sometimes with mixed results. And that was the one number I had the weakest grasp of. Meanwhile, the third bell was ringing and I went up to the stage, heart beating madly. The fact that I barely knew what I was to do on stage, however, did not scare me so much as the pants. My word, how could they put a girl on in a pair of pants? But whether I liked it or not, I was thrust onto the set and behind me I heard the words, on stage, anything is permitted. When I returned to my dressing room after the performance, I wondered how I was meant to wash off my makeup. But the hairdresser Antony soon came and removed it by applying a bit of pork fat to my face. I remained standing there with cheeks absolutely shining from grease. The actress Trilling noticed and said to me, powder up a bit. And so I threw some powder on and looked all together like a miller. Anyway, she comes home, she goes home with a man who would eventually be her husband, uh, Kaminsky, she, he escorts her to her home where she lives with her sisters. Very end, after arriving home, I quickly went to bed, but I could not fall asleep until it was quite late. When morning came, the household did not wake me, letting me sleep in a bit. They had gained a bit of respect for their little artist. And anyhow, this was Shabbos morning, and on Shabbos, we always sleep in. Around noon, my family came in and asked me, so? How did, it all, how did it all go, little artist? How much did you earn? But I refused to answer. So she had this wonderful experience, moment of pride, didn't want to let uh, her meddling family necessarily ruin it by talking about it and offering their opinions because they were quite meddling. And um, she really did have to be a bit of a... Um... The only word I can think of as badass, which is maybe uh, not for all audiences, but in that time being in Yiddish theater really required quite a bit of daring do. A lot of these times, a lot of times these people were raised in very, very from uh, pious, strict environments and being on stage was unheard of. And indeed, Esther Rachel Kaminska, Kaminska experienced this growing up in a very, very pious household. And going into the Yiddish theater was um, really, quite scandalous for her family and made life very difficult for her in her early days and until she managed to strike out on her own and manage on her own. Uh, so really quite oh, uh, bold and audacious sort of woman and very intelligent and funny. And I'm ex enjoying translating her memoirs, which you'll be able to find eventually from, uh, from Syracuse University Press when this anthology of women on the Yiddish stage is published. Um, yes. Um, let's see. All right. So she, another thing I wanted to talk about, just something that's revealed by that excerpt is she says she was able to sleep in the day after because it was Shabbos. Uh, morning and people nap on Shabbos and sleep in. And you might be wondering about considering these were all Jews, how could they have been performing Friday nights? Uh, but in fact, Friday nights just shows you that, uh, you know, the current generation hasn't fallen so far that prior generations weren't already sort of, um, you know, innovating and towing the line a bit when it came to strict rule and custom. Uh, Back then, Friday night was a very big night for the Yiddish theater. So it wasn't uh, that all the Jews stayed homes and kept Shabbos necessarily. Um, there were a lot of folks who wanted to go out Friday night and see a play in their own language in Yiddish. And this was their way of honoring their Jewishness. Um, and the more pious among them sometimes did finagle a kind of thing where they would pay in advance or be on a list. And that, that was often done as well, so they wouldn't actually have to exchange money on Shabbos. Uh, but Friday night was a big night for the Yiddish theater. Um, yeah. I feel like there was something, one other thing that I noticed that was funny, a lot of funny stuff. I, I love this of her face being daubed with pork fat, um, that, that being part of the makeup routine, which um, was probably also you know, shocking for her, but there was a lot that she had to get used to. Um, even I recently translated an excerpt where she goes to dinner and that took a lot of getting used to because the actresses were invited out to dinner by, um, 
sort of the governor of the province they were performing in in Poland who was not Jewish and inviting them out to dinner to dine at a fancy restaurant and it wasn't kosher and there's a lot going on in her head uh, which she gets out on the page. Um, there's one line that she keeps repeating not uh, as a joke but this is just how she feels. They're traveling from shtetl to shtetl and making theater wherever they go, whether or not there is an actual theater. So often they find a, a horse barn to perform in. And she always has this line where she says, they got to the horse barn, they rented it out, they dragged out barrels and hay and manure, and it was already starting to look like a theater. She always has this beautifully sunny line, um, really making the best of some, you know, not the greatest circumstances for putting on theater. But, you know, the show goes on as it does here as well. It's funny having to make your bed uh, for, uh, to, in order to perform. Um, that's not usually part of the performance routine, getting ready for a show, but today it was. Um, yes. So she talked about performing in the sorceress. She played the ingenue in the sorceress, the young woman figure whose name is Mirele. Mirele is the sort of much put upon motherless girl who goes through a lot of struggle and misery in the course of the show. Um, and the sorceress is the woman who basically puts her through all that misery. And the sorceress is always played by a man. And we see this throughout Esther Rochel's Kaminska's memoirs. She says, I played Mirele and Herr or so-and-so played the sorceress, Mr. Whoever it was. And it's always been the case. Uh, it's a, just a tradition of the Yiddish theater going back a long time since the play was premiered in the 1870s, written by Avram Goldfan, who's considered the father of the Yiddish theater. So we have the mother, Esther Rochel. The father is often considered Avram Goldfaden. And yeah, it's this sort of stock character, this witch that's played by a man. You find it not only in this play, but in a lot of, European dramas of the time and earlier, going back hundreds of years, where old women and um, witches are often played by men uh, in what's called a dame role, which is you have trouser roles that are women who are playing men or boys, often women played young boys, like Peter Pan, of course, is a famous example. And the dame roles, which still exist today in British pantomimes, um, that are performed around Christmas times, uh, those are played by men. That was something the New York Times pointed out when they came to see The Sorceress, our production of The Sorceress, which, which they named as a critic's pick. They said, it was like a pantomime, such a panto, such as they play in England during Christmas time, and we were playing in December around Hanukkah time. And they said, America doesn't have a tradition of these sort of lively, silly entertainments, outlandish and fun, gaudy and colorful that are played at Christmas time. Uh, but we should. And why shouldn't this Christmas tradition be a Hanukkah tradition? And now we have that in The Sorceress and, and a classic dame role in Bobby Yachne, The Sorceress. So I was happy to play this dame role. Um, other people who have played it over time, you have there Maurice Schwartz, who is a famous actor who led the Yiddish art theater in Manhattan in the Lower East Side, which was the center of Yiddish theater. Second Avenue was like the Yiddish Broadway. He's there, um, you know, looking very haggish, playing Baba Yachne, Grandmother Yachne, who's the sorceress, uh, a fellow Oscar Sol Solmanesco in the middle who's playing Baba Yachne, and there's me. Um, just with a selfie I took backstage playing the Bobby Yachne. Um, yeah, I think maybe my Bobby Yachne was a bit um, sexier, maybe. I was aided a lot by the costume they had me in, which was uh, sort of, there was a lot of, you know, padding with a lot of curvaceousness going on and then a sort of corset to sort of cinch it all in. And it gave me a rather nice shape. And I you know I felt that she's already this sort of villainous character. We don't need to malign her further by making her like as ugly as possible. So why not go a bit in, you know, another direction and make her, you know, a bit glamorous. 
um, in her own witchy way. So Motel Dinner, the director and I were able to work on that and put together something interesting. Um, the various phases of Bobby Yachne. <clears throat> Me just trying on uh, false fingernails for the first time. Uh, we did it uh, just back in my room and seeing how they looked. And then sort of in between phase of me and Bobby Yachna makeup, but in my own clothes, which I often went out in, in between performances if we had two in a day, or I would go sometimes home in them if I didn't want to go through the trouble of, you know, putting on the pork fat as Esther Rochel did and taking it all off. And there in, in full Bobby Yachna drag, uh, complete with eye painted on forehead, which I did for this scene where Bobby Yachn is reading cards and divining people's futures. Um, <clears throat> so that's Bobby Yachn and uh, the sorceress. And I wanna show you, well, here's a few more photos of us in action in this production directed by Motel Didner, music directed by Zalman Mlotek at the Yiddish Theater, Jasmine Gorslein playing Mirele, there I'm trapping her in, um, in a coat that has a rope attached in which I'm um, binding her in order to kidnap her. So, just another day of being Bobe uh, with Rachel Bachan as a, another, a, a sort of scheming soul sister of mine and plotting things together. Me with uh, my fellow witches um, gathered around the cauldron. Yes. Uh, Lauren Zakular, Lexi Rabadi, and Danny Apple there. Uh, and then me in the middle, uh, brewing a potion. Right. So I want to uh, perform a bit for you, the mm, Boba In this scene, this is her first entrance into the show. She comes on and enters the home of Basia, who you saw um, Rachel Bachin was there in the red dress. And there I come in. Basia has called for me and asks me for my help in plotting something so that she can take all of her stepdaughter's money, Mirela's money, and uh, just, I hatch my plan here and reveal all this trickery I'm about to do. And um, she's the sort of character that enjoys scheming and enjoys making people's lives hell. Uh, but you like her anyway because she has such fun doing it and she's hopefully a sort of magnetic creature. Um, so it was fun to play with that on stage. So here's her opening monologue. <coughs> Sees wie der Basje was hast du es mich geschickt riefen? Geh schon, geh noch rätst du wie ein Kind. Noch ist wieder ungerät, dass ich die jenem Küche für ich stecke Messer in der Erde rein, mache ich etwas mit dem. <lacht> die Kindsen mache ich nur Oiszinaren Geld bei den Runen, was sind in Vergleiten drinnen. Basje. Hat dann die ganze Stadt nicht gesagt, bis als die Host Kasten gehabt mit der Brömmchen, als die Host immer eine Küche vorgetan? Brömm, Brömm, Sinn, was ist gewesen? Ich hab prost heraus gesehen, als ein Brömmchen, als ein reicher Almen. Und hat mehr nicht wie ein einzig Kind. Und die bist doch gewesen, und ohne mir wüsste Almone. <lacht> Hab ich dir geheißen, die soll sich reinziehen, sie ihm ein Schreines. Und sich kleiner ist, machen einen Eingang zum Kind. Im Hanfen in den Schmächlen, sie bedienen. Und in dem ist bestanden der ganze Kirche, sind weiter gar nicht. In das, was man hat jetzt der Brömmchen eingesetzt, hat doch die ganze Stadt nicht verstanden, was das bedeutet. Aber in der Emsin, was ist geschehen? Das Dreidel habe ich gedreht durch dein Vetter Eljocken. Er soll machen falsche Simis und falsche Banknoten. Und soll es ihm Tacke allein hinterwerfen, ihm Tacke allein hintermassern. Und es ist Tacke, als sei geschehen. Hm? 
Patienten was ihr dreht die Bobbyjacht mit noch hat Dreh. Was ist das bei Hessen bei Eicher? Kirsche! Als war dein Mann so weggehen, hat er übergeschrieben die Kleid mit den Häusern auf deinen Nummern. Nach dem übrigen Geld, was gehört sie seine Tochter, hat er Dichtag gemacht, war er die Trappes darüber. Wir müssen diese Putter wehren. Das ist eine Kleinigkeit. Herrsche mich aus. Die schickt sie mir heute in Marker rein nach Fleisch. Und das Geld, was die Wester darf ihn mitgeben, sollst du es ihr Tag alleine reinlegen in Käschen. Ein Tag kommen, ey, Baby, ihr müsst zurück und rausnehmen. Kadea, sie soll es gar nicht bemerken, verstehst du? Nu, in der Nu. Was soll ich wissen? Ich bin in Marke rein und werde nicht hungern, sie wird zu lehnen für ein Fleisch. Hat sie doch schon in das Dumme, Meure um nach Hause zu kommen. Warum sie kennt dich doch schon, was für ein Schlag du bist. <lacht> nu, und dann noch. So, wie sie wird stehen auf dem Mark. Will ich schon hinterkommen? In welch ein bisschen, was ich habe mit dir zu tun? Nu, halt mich du mir nicht auf. Weil ich will nicht, dass er mit seiner Sohle mich treffen. Warum durchdenken, Kali wäre in der ganzen Küche, verstehst du? Nun, ein Gesicht und hab Seichel. So. Aber ja. Ah, uh, I will. A sort of. Remarkable circumstance led me to audition for that show. The first time we did it in 2017, that was my first professional experience uh, direct um, on the Yiddish stage. And I was working at the Yiddish Book Center at the time and a group of artists came seeking inspiration for their various creative endeavors. And I was, uh, they were, came from the organization Reboot. And I was one of the people sort of on faculty, helping them to discover things um, and find resources for them at the Yiddish Book Center. Some of them were interested in the Yiddish occult, what connections Yiddish had to the occult and to superstition and magic and all sorts of thing like, things like that. So I was finding resources for them and finding old spells and records of amulets and all kinds of things. But then I also remember there's this play called The Sorceress. So maybe I'll show them some stuff about that. So I went and looked up The Sorceress, finding resources and plot information, stuff like that I could share with these artists who didn't know too much about Yiddish, but they were interested. And saw that the Volksbühne was host, having auditions for The Sorceress for an upcoming production. So, so I printed that out, that audition notice, and brought it into my session with them. And I said, well, here, you're, some of you are actors, and you should um, go and audition for the show. And you live in New York anyway, and why not try out? And they thought this was ludicrous, that they who didn't speak Yiddish, although most of the casts of these shows that the folks being puts on are not Yiddish speaking, and they learn in the context of, this and the, of doing the show. But anyway, they were not into the idea of my, uh, of, of going and auditioning for it, them, but they said, Michal, you must go and audition. Um, although I was just working as a research fellow at the Yiddish Book Center at the time. And the whole weekend that they were at the Yiddish Book Center, they kept pressuring and even talked to my supervisors, asking if Michal could get time off to go to New York and audition and being, um, you know, really mixing in in a way, uh, in a way that amused me, but I was sort of not taking seriously, but then I got to take it more and more seriously. Anyway, I ended up taking a bus down to the city and auditioning and with a Yiddish song that I found in the sort of a basement vault of the Yiddish Book Center, just on old crumbling bits of sheet music and audition with this. And then on the bus ride back, I remember Jimmy Beth Margolis, the casting director, calling me and saying, I know we gave you those sides to prepare for the callback. I was on my bus back to New York and for these other characters, but could you also prepare the sides for the sorceress herself? And this was a, a, a wunder to me. I didn't imagine having that role, the title role in my first outing in professional Yiddish theater, but I thought I'd give it a go. I went to a thrift shop that weekend in um, Western Mass and bought a skirt 
so I could wear a skirt at the callback because I thought, why not? If a, a lady is trying out for this role, she'll probably be wearing a skirt so she can, you know, swish it around and engage it in that sort of witchy sort of way. And I thought, why shouldn't I at least have that um, advantage? So, and got the role. And that was a, a wonderful thing. And I'm very glad to have done that. Somebody asks me about a Grace Paley story that has to do with the Yiddish theater. And I've read Grace Paley, but I don't know that story and I must read it. So um, I, I, that, I'll put that on my reading list. So thank you for that, Lawrence. Um, yes. Um, right. No, 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 no. Share screen. I want to do some more. Um, some more performing or something of the kind. Oh. Mm. This is, I'm sorry. Oh, oh damn. <sighs> Not the easiest thing always, these things. Oh boy. Um, I want to, uh, <laughs> one moment. View. I want to see these slides. Navigator. Show me the navigator. Okay, that makes things a lot easier. All right. This is an actual clip. I'm not allowed to show much from the sorceress of actual performance for because of union rules. But I can show this tiny clip of me trapping Mirale in the marketplace. Um, just just so you get a taste of what it looked like on stage. So let's see. Mm. That's sort of a famous song from the show. Um, Kim Tsimir, come to me. Starts out tricking her, pretending she's this kindly old bubba, eventually reveals herself as the witch, and eventually leads her back to her lair, which is almost like a brothel, really. It seems like she, she is sort of, a, unfortunately, uh, a sex trafficker, really. She eventually sells Mirale into what seems like sexual slavery in Turkey. Uh, a lot going on in that play. Um, yeah. Um, another play I wanted to talk about that I've not taken part in, but I thought it relevant to these times we're in right now. This one is a play that looks at social issues in a much more serious way than, than the sorceress does. The sorceress is really all about entertainment. Um, and this play, Mississippi, is about entertainment as all plays are, as well as education, and really talking about problems that humanity is faced with, offering solutions, offering hope, shining a light. Um, that's what Leib Malach's Mississippi does, which I've recently come upon, and I've been much aided by Alyssa Quint, whom I mentioned earlier in, she's, research this play a lot and has a lot of wonderful resources to share about it. This is a play that talks about the problem of the scourge of anti-black racism in America. And it's a Yiddish play about that topic. And you might be surprised by that, but in fact, the Yiddish theater commented on all kinds of things, not just, as it was said, the Yiddish agas, the Yiddish street, the Jewish sphere, commented on issues that were present in the world and especially in humanity and prejudice and racism because the Jews were faced with these sorts of issues wherever they were in the world as well. So the best of them had great compassion for fellow sufferers of persecution and of ethnic hatred 
And this guy, Leib Malach, and that was his stage name, it means Leib Angel. Uh, Leib Zaltzman, I believe, was his birth name. Wrote this play, Mississippi, about the Scottsboro Boys trial. So a group of African-American boys who were on a train and got into a sort of scuffle with these white youths who ended up instigating this thing whereby these two white girls on the train falsely accused the Scottsboro boys, because it was in Scottsboro, Alabama, although the play is called Mississippi, uh, accused the boys of rape and nine boys, trials, lynch mobs, terrible, terrible things, all of which had false accusations and imprisonment on no grounds. Um, all of which Leib Malach brings into this really incisive, innovative play, Mississippi, which premieres in the 1930s in Warsaw. This is Leib Malach, who you see here, hopefully. And this is a cover of the play when it was translated into Esperanto and published. Um, Esperanto, of course, the language, the artificial language invented by Ludwig Zamenhof, who grew up in Bialystok and was himself a native Yiddish speaker and bases some of the structures and vocabulary of Esperanto on Yiddish. And eventually this play is translated into Esperanto, but that's not the main point. The main point is that it was this worthwhile, interesting play that comments on these issues, comments usefully, I think, on anti-blackness in America and comes to some important realizations and educates audiences about it, especially audiences who may not have known about it. Um, there's this quote that Alyssa Quint, I found in an article of hers, a journalist, Y. Gottlieb, Mm, do, 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 do. Now I'm going to read a different quote by a different journalist. This is a, uh, this is a journalist, Moises Kanfer, writing for a Polish Jewish newspaper in 1937 about a production of the play in Krakow. It's no surprise that a Jewish author wrote this. Aren't Jews in many European countries these days just like the black people of America? Aren't we fighting for the most primitive right to live? then do not be surprised that the one who wrote a play about the tragic misery of American blacks is a Jew. And that line stuck out to me, um, fighting for the most primitive right, the simplest, most basic right to live, which is um, what the black population of America is fighting for today. That's really what the slogan Black Lives Matter is all about. Um, so I wanted to perform just a little excerpt of this play and to show you what it's like, this Yiddish play, Mississippi. There's a poster for, uh, I believe it's premiere production at the Jung Theater in Warsaw, which was an experimental Yiddish theater um, directed by a guy called Michel Brandt. Um, and there it is, Mississippi. This is um, the speech of one of the prisoners, one of the men who is wrongly convicted and imprisoned, and he hears that someone may deny, that one of the accusers may deny what has taken place and they might all be set free, but he has a second thought about this, which he expresses in this speech. Und als sie soll erzählen dem MS, wird man den glauben? Und als mir soll viele freilassen, wird man den nicht lynchen? Besser scheint da sitzen, eher zerrissen werden von die Weiße. Koba mal gesehen, wie man hat gehabt einem von unserer Leid, der Fahr, was er hat gegangen wie Tahun. Ihr Herr Tahun, er schon hat Bräut gefällt. Er schon ist ein Kind krank gewesen, es konnte treffen, ist wie viel wert ein Hund, noch mehr sagen ein Dollar. Hat man ihn zugebunden zum Beidel von einem Pferd, einem wilden Mexikaner Pferd, und also hat er sich noch geschleppt in Felder rein und geschlagen hat man. 
an abgeschwundener Ochsis erscheint gewesen, wenn man hat ihm zugebunden zu einem Bäum und weiße Weiber haben auf ihm gegossen mit Nacht. Und wenn die Flammen haben schon über ihm geknackt, haben die Ku Klux Klan gehalten, brennende Kezähle mit ihm und gesungen darum ihm das schwarze Tierlied. Ihr habt es einmal gehört, das schwarze Lied? And then there's a recitative, a sort of the choir from offstage sings this hanging song. But I, I didn't want to do that song because it's really terrible and um, just a, a, a white mass shouting and, and for blood, really. And it works in the context of the play, I'm sure, but I thought right now uh, I'd end with a more, uh, this part of the talk would end with a more hopeful part of the play, which is the final song. He puts in a lot of songs, actually, and it ends with a protest song. Maybe not unlike a protest song you'd hear on the streets today in any major city in America. It's come to a climax, the play. They're trying to break free of police wagon and um, a scene of great chaos. And then you hear this chorus rising, and that's how the play ends. And there, it would have been sung with a tune, but I don't know it, so I'm just going to read it. Bei Mississippi in dem Dorm, dort ein blutig in die Quorum, dort wollen glien fonnen und monnen und monnen. Bei Mississippi in dem Dorm, dort schließen Orms sich zu Orms und von Zorn aufgebräusten Flammen fäusten, Flammen fäusten. Quite an interesting play, all of this done in Yiddish, this story told in Yiddish, all of the characters speak in Yiddish, whether they're white or black or Jewish or Gentile, it doesn't matter, they're all speaking Yiddish. And um, played by Yiddish speaking Jewish actors. So you might be wondering about that. They were made up, I believe, um, with blackface. So it's, it, it, you know, this was the convention of the time, and in Warsaw it was done this way, and it would be too, too horrible to see it done that way today. Because um, it's a different time and a different place, and, um, but maybe some way, somehow, this could be performed, um, you know, as it ought to be performed according to today's accepted standards, which are important ones. So, interesting stuff there. Um, maybe I'll look at the uh, Q&A and... Michael, um, I'm happy to, to jump back in and field the questions for the Q&A. Um, yeah. So we have, um, we have two questions and in addition, if anyone has more questions, feel free to type them in as we go. And I also have a few questions to, uh, to ask myself, so we'll, we'll get it started. But I'll start with, um, there's a question here from from Pammy Brenner. Um, was your relationship to Yiddish born out of your involvement in Yiddish theater, or did you have an independent connection to the language and culture that eventually converged with your interest in theater? Yeah, well, <clears throat> interestingly, I had a grandmother in whom these streams converged in her own person. Um, my grandmother, Elizabeth Elkin Weiss, Olea Sholem, together with my grandfather, Reuben Weiss, they were both actors. That was their profession in Detroit. And they acted on stage and in early radio and on television. And they were also deeply fascinated by Yiddish. And my grandmother, when I was growing up, led <clears throat> a Yiddish club at our local JCC. And she would perform in Yiddish and had Yiddish books and movies to share with me. So I really got a lot of that, both the interest in Yiddish language and culture and in theater as a profession from her and in the feasibility of a theater as a profession, which, you know, some people grow up with not, with that, and not possibly imagining that that could be a profession. Uh, but I grew up with the sense that my grandparents had done that as a profession and raised five kids. And that's something, you know, that could be a person's work. Um, and not just a person's passion, it could be both. So I'd say all, all, sort of all of that came from her and then I kind of discovered it from my own, yeah. But there was a, I had a, a, inherited a, a Yerusha, an inheritance of this sort of thing, yeah. 
Oh, we have a question from Cameron Bernstein. She says, I've been translating a play by Paula Prulipsky in uh, and in passing a biography of her husband, Noyek Prolutsky mentions that Paula became acquainted with Esther Rojo Kamenska, who later performed in the Yiddish dramas Paula wrote under her husband's influence. So she wants to know if you've ever heard of Paula or the Prolitskys in, uh, in Kaminska's writing, if she comes up at all. She has not come up yet. Um, I'm still finishing. Um, and she doesn't actually get to covering the entirety of her career, I believe, because she died in the midst of writing it. So she doesn't get to everything. Um, like the last entry is really, um, it's not really an ending. Um, I think maybe, maybe she did finish rewriting it, but it wasn't published. Um, anyway, no, I've not encountered this, but mm -hmm. hopefully. Uh, Esther, Esther Rochel Kamenska's daughter was Ida Kamenska, is that right? That's or right. Ida Kaminska was equally famous, even more famous in the non-Yiddish world because she acted in non-Yiddish movies in, in, in Czech and was nominated for an Oscar actually for Best Supporting Actress for, uh, you know, The Shop on the Corner or whatever that movie was called, this Czech movie that was up for foreign film and she was nominated actually for Best Supporting Actress. So. We have, um, let's see, one more, a question from Eric Gordon. What's coming up in your future as a Yiddish actor? Well, um, mm, it's really as sort of nebulous as anyone's right now who works in theater because theaters are not open and there's no signs of them opening anytime soon. Um, but one does what one can in these strange times and writes and imagines and collaborates with friends on projects. And uh, so nothing, nothing is certain right now, um, but I certainly hope to act in more Yiddish theater, possibly direct, which I've done um, also. Mm, yeah, um, but it's all to be seen because right now uh, is a bit of a sad time for theater. Everything's dark. Yeah. Well, you've been doing these, these videos Yes, work. I've been doing, uh, it's been one creative outlet during this time is these sort of um, videos for the Workers' Circle, which you can find on the Workers' Circle, Facebook or YouTube or Instagram, wherever you are, uh, every two weeks posting these videos that sort of present Yiddish in a joyful way and a creative way, hopefully, and teach a thing or two and um, a way to yeah, make some art in Yiddish and show the vitality of Yiddish. We have two, some more questions here. And also I have a question for you, which is related to what you just spoke about. So maybe I'll ask my question and then have these two. So my question is, uh, how is teaching related to theater for you? I know you've done both. And do you, do you incorporate a lot of theater into your teaching? Do you think about teaching differently because you work in theater? Yeah. Um, I have incorporated into my Yiddish teaching, and I think it's a really wonderful thing to do, actually, uh, which I talked about that example of being in college and acting in that play directed by Deborah Kaplan. I was sort of inspired by the way she did that and ended up doing it myself with a group of, I worked as a Spanish teacher for a while at my alma mater high school, the Franco Jewish Academy in Detroit, and ended up getting a grant for the school from the Fishman Foundation for Yiddish Culture to direct a play in Yiddish with the students there, students who did not know Yiddish. And we directed, we did this play entirely in Yiddish called Nachts bei Nacht. And I've used theater in classes too, teaching Yiddish as I did at the University of Michigan. To me, you have in a Yiddish play words already written in the most artistic but also the most idiomatic way by native Yiddish speakers and authors who were trying to write in the rhythms of people such as they encountered in their lives. And it's this wonderful sort of time capsule of how people talked or, you know, often heightened for the drama, but you have it all there, sort of this, this capsule of Yiddish life and speech and dialogue. So if a student who is studying Yiddish memorizes, really takes time to incorporate and get into their blood scenes from Yiddish theater, it's 
doing a lot for them all at once. It's training them in the rhythms of this language and idiomatic expressions and ways to make yourself understood and to express all sorts of passions and wonderful things in Yiddish in an authentic, in an idiomatic way, uh, colloquial way. Um, so I think it's great for that. And even if you don't know that much, you can memorize, if you're a beginner, you can memorize a monologue or a scene and that can give you stuff you'll later build on. So you can sort of get the speech first and then later add to it grammar and sense of vocabulary and everything. But you've already have, have it sort of in your bones, the rhythms kind of, and uh, the, the way people speak. And that's a really useful thing. So we have a question from Sarah Biskowitz. Um, how does nostalgia influence the contemporary world of Yiddish theater? And how do you think the next generation of young Yiddishists like you will change Yiddish theater? Mm -hmm. um, nostalgia is an important force. Um, we have people in, in, you know, not nostalgia, even for times and places that they never experienced in their lives, people can feel it. People came to Fiddler and said, you know, although it was a very bare stage that we had, uh, it was sort of a very minimalist kind of production, visually, they felt like they were there and they felt like they were transported to the shtetl and to the world of their great grandparents and they were crying because of it. They spent the whole production, all three hours crying, which uh, I imagine would really dry you out. But um, that was, you know, an important thing for people and a way people connected to it and not a bad thing. And, you know, it, in, it probably led them on to a deeper exploration, hopefully, of that world and of the language. And I think for many it did. Many came out of seeing that show who had never had any experience with Yiddish culture and language and said, I want to go start taking Yiddish now. And, you know, so there should be more of that and more engagement and deeper engagement. And um, how will my generation change the Yiddish theater? Um, hopefully keep, keep innovating and doing, taking chances. Something that I've been learning about this play Mississippi is that it was done in a theater that considered itself, and it's right there actually on the poster in Yiddish, an experimental theater. Um, these were not people who were just interested in putting on works of the past and doing them in the expected way. They were interested in writing for our times, writing on new themes and doing them in a very experimental way. This Mississippi was performed on three different simultaneous, on three stages simultaneously and it's sort of like an immersive theater experience would be today. They were doing it then in the thirties. And when one character was in one stage, the lights would go up on him, the lights would go off, they'd go up on another character. So you'd be having this interplay between stages and to me, this was like, you know, just a wonderful thing to read about. And I think we should continue bringing that spirit, that avant-garde experimental, pushing things forward, taking chances, um, imagining. Hopefully we do a lot, we do a lot of that, yeah. We have a question about, are there other plays like Mississippi? Are there other plays about the African-American experience in the Yiddish theater corpus? Um, yes. Another play put on by this Jung Theater in Warsaw, because they also put on translations of other of world theater into Yiddish. They did um, Eugene O'Neill, All God's Chillin' Got Wings. Um, that's one. I'm sure there are many others. I don't know too much about all of them. And I, I really, I would like to go and study and learn more and find more examples. But uh, we do have a gem, I think, in this Mississippi. I know yeah. that um, Rachel Rubenstein has written an article about stagings of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Yes, which was very popular as a novel in Yiddish, translate, translated into Yiddish. And yeah, you're right. That was also seen on stage. We have one more question here, uh, which is from Daniel Greenberg. That he asks, I've just started learning Yiddish, so, um, he doesn't know if this is a, a question that he should know the answer to already, but what dialect of Yiddish does modern Jewish theater use? Uh, is it, does it, is it attempt to be modern or neutral? Do you try to mirror the dialect that might've been used when it was written? Um, so how do, you, how do you handle questions of dialect? Mm -hmm. 
it varies from show to show. And we used a different one for the Sorosuris than we did for Fiddler, than we did for uh, the reading of the Gollum that I was in by Hey Leivik. Um, but the standard Ling dialect for theatrical performance in Yiddish is called Bina Yiddish, uh, which is stage Yiddish. The folks Bina is the people's stage. So Bina means stage. But it's uh, based, I believe, on sort of Southeastern Romanian dialects of Yiddish, because that's sort of where the Yiddish theater was founded uh, by Avram Goldfan, was from Romania, and that's where a lot of the early troops were based. And so sort of based on that dialect of Yiddish. So not, typically not the Klal Yiddish or the standard Yiddish that you'd hear being taught in a classroom today, but a different dialect. Um, we yeah. have a question about where we can find a copy of Mississippi if people want to read it themselves. Yeah, well, it's not published in English. It not There's no translation published. I believe Alyssa Quint is working on one, so maybe that will come out eventually. But you can read it in Yiddish. If you can read Yiddish, you can go to the Yiddish Book Center website and type in the name of Leib Malach, and you'll find a huge volume of all about his life and containing all of his works like 500 pages or something. But in that book is the entirety of Mississippi. Yes. Um, if, we, uh, if we have time, I'll perform one more little song. Sure, that would be terrific. We'll um, to close us out. And then, um, so, and then I'll say my thank yous afterwards. So you go ahead and, and perform your song and then afterward I will appropriately uh, thank you. Wonderful. Um, okay, so share screen. Okay. Um, Bobby Yachna is not given a song in the context of the show. She doesn't have a song of her own, which, uh, I mean, she's she has songs with other people, duets and ensembles and moments of music, which is fun, but she doesn't have her own big number. Um, but the Soviet Yiddish theater, the Moscow State Yiddish Theater in the 20s did a production, a sort of modernist production of the Kishif Macharin, the sorceress, and gave her a song. And their song is really about how much she loves money and how she'll do anything for money. And to me, it's sort of very in line with Soviet values, sort of very kind of anti-capitalist. Uh, anti-superstitious, anti-religion, whatever it is, but they put a lot on Bobby Yachne. And this is her song where she says, I'm Bobby Yachne and here's what I am. <clears throat> and I never performed this because it wasn't in our production. I brought it up with our musical director, wonderful musical director, Zalman Mlotek, and said, look at this really old cylinder recording from the 20s I found of Binyomin Zuskin, who was eventually murdered by Stalin, uh, along with many other Yiddish artists. Um, executed by Stalin's government. Um, anyway, I said, how about we do this in the show? And he said, mm -mm, it's really cool, but it doesn't sound at all like Goldfaden, who composed the original music, so we're not going to do it. But this is my uh, bedroom, and I can do it. Uh, it's my party, and I'll bob it if I want to. Um, so here it is. Mm. <laughs> ich bin Bobby Yacht, ich bin Schein du. Die Kischef Macherin ist du. In a Gitter, in a Mazel die Kershu. Ich bin, oh, ich bin. Also gerin, a klugerin, a hellserin, a sternserin, a sprecherin, a trefferin. A bube jachne in Safgurer Welt, a bi parnose kriegen a bi Geld, hoi in Geld. Ich war verkurt, ich lata so, ich drei Jahre und ich bin ein Schlachtig, nes batug und traf ein Nach. A bube jachne in Safgurer Welt. Habi parno se kriegen na bi geld, hoi in geld. Ich bin 
<laughs> Thank you so much. It was um, terrific. The whole the lecture was terrific, and the performances were excellent. And it was so wonderful to have you here, uh, as it were, to talk to us. And um, I also just want to take a minute to thank Esther Peters and Matthew Wefflin from the series for all of their help in making this event possible. Um, and thank you to everyone who came. This is. Um, such a pleasure to be able to get together and, and learn from you. A pleasure for me. So thank you very much. Uh,